Hamilton Arts Council serves arts communities within the Greater Hamilton area, including Ancaster, Dundas, Flambro, Glanbrook, Hamilton, Stony Creek, Waterdown, and Six Nations of the Grand River. We acknowledge that this area is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Hamilton Arts Council envision a dynamic arts community that is innovative, impactful, diverse and professionally sustainable. I hope you've had an opportunity to explore all of the upcoming professional development sessions taking place between October and December in 2021. You can find these via Hamilton Arts Council's website at www.hamiltonartscouncil.ca, click programs and then professional development. All sessions are free to attend and are presented in partnership with the City of Hamilton's Tourism and Culture Division. If you have any questions or comments regarding this program or any other program from Hamilton Arts Council, I invite you to email me, David, at community at hamiltonartscouncil.ca. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Hamilton Arts Council. I am very, very happy to be here. Um, I wish I could be there in person. I was in Hamilton a few years ago, and I very, very much enjoy visiting your city. So thank you for having me back, even if only virtually. Um, I love this part of my job. So uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to do it. Um, so let's get right into it. If I can make my PowerPoint work. Um, so I would like to take a moment to recognize that the Canada Council's offices, as well as my own home from where I'm working today, are on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation, whose presence here reaches back to time immemorial. The Canada Council for the Arts respects and affirms the inherent, the inherent right of the Indigenous peoples of this land. The Council continues to honor the commitments we have made to Indigenous nations and peoples, which includes acknowledging the historical oppression of lands, cultures, and the original peoples in what we now know as Canada, and fervently believes the, that the arts contribute to the healing and decolonizing journey that we all share together. So thank you for allowing me to share that. Um, I want to just offer a little bit of thanks to the Hamilton Arts Council um, for hosting and for organizing this professional development series in 2021. I can just, I can, I remember very vividly um, how successful the last outreach session we did at Hamilton Arts Council. I can't remember the name of your building, but it's a fabulous building. Um, and I had such a good time there and that building was packed to the rafters when we did our two day session. And from what I understand, um, this virtual room is pretty packed too. I don't know how many people are here now, but when I heard that there may have been 187 people registered, that goes to show just how well your organization is serving your community for this kind of work. So thank you to them. Um, I'll tell you just a little bit about me. Um, so I am a program officer at the Canada Council for the Arts working in the Explore and Create program. And shortly, I'll tell you what I mean by that program. Um, I am originally from Montreal. I lived in Vancouver for about 10 years. I've been in Ottawa since 2014. I've been working at council since 2017. Um, prior to that, and I suppose continuing so, I have worked as a professional theater artist and administrator for going on 30 years right now. Um, I've also worked outside of theater, working for many dance companies as a tour coordinator. And I was the producer of many uh, multicultural South Asian festivals. And I only mention all of this, um, not to show uh, any kind of resume, but to let you know that officers like myself are um, very much, not all of us, but many of us are artists first and foremost, and we bring that perspective to our work. Um, as many of you, I've also written a lot of grants, so I know the process and the highs and lows of it quite intimately. Um, last little bit, 
I've got a dog here with me. Um, and right now that dog is sleeping peacefully. But if that dog wakes up, uh, it'll get loud and I'll have to deal with it. But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, today's info session. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention when I was talking about my intro, I have a rough idea of who is in the audience uh, listening. Um, from what I gather, there are people from all different uh, kinds of artistic discipline. I'm a theater artist. I'm sure there are theater artists out there, but I'm sure there's writers and visual artists and musicians and so forth. Um, and from what I also understand, um, among the many of you listening, there are different levels of familiarity with the Canada Council. That's okay. This presentation is going to try to offer information that I hope is useful to everyone. Um, but of course, it will be presented at a bit of a starter level. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, it's going to be a basic overview of how things work at Canada Council, um, what are the funding opportunities that are available, and what is the process for applying. I'll start by telling you a little bit about the Canada Council as an organization. Then we'll talk about what we call our online portal and the process for creating and submitting your artist profile. Of course, I wanna give you plenty of info on the various funding opportunities that are available to you. Then we'll dive into the actual grant application process. And if there's time, and I hope there is time, I'll share some tips on grant writing. There will be plenty of opportunities for questions during this presentation. I've got uh, little places after every section where we can talk about questions. Um, and of course, there'll be time at the end. And I will do my best to answer all questions um, as best I can. So we're going to just start off with a little bit of info about the Canada Council for the Arts. I don't want to bore you too much with everything about us because I'd rather focus on you. Um, but just in case you have no idea who we are and what we do, the Canada Council for the Arts is Canada's national arts funding agency with a national mandate to foster and promote the study, enjoyment, creation, and production of art. We champion and invest in artistic excellence through our grants, services, prizes, and payments to Canadian arts and arts organizations. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we provide funding mainly through grants, but also through prizes and other initiatives, initiatives to artists, groups, and arts organizations all across the country through a grant competition process in order that artists can create and share art and so that together we can support an amazing, robust, and diverse cultural milieu. Um, now, we have a lot of guiding principles. I'll be talking a little bit about some of those principles. Among our guiding principles is the principle of peer assessment, which is the process by which grant applications submitted by artists are assessed by other professional artists. In other words, your peers. Peer assessment is the basis for most funding decisions at the Canada Council. Um, another one of our guiding principles is the principle of equity, where the Canada Council recognizes that not all people experience equal access to resources, opportunities, or benefits, and that also includes equal access to public arts funding. Not all people have equal access to that. Achieving equality does not necessarily mean treating individuals or groups in the same way, but it may require the use of specific measures to ensure fairness. One of the measures that the Council has in place to address in equ uh, inequity is the creation of what we call designated priority groups. Um, these include a, we, sorry, while the Council is aware that a wide array of groups face systemic barriers. Currently, the Canada Council has identified the following equity-seeking groups as the beneficiaries of specially targeted funds and initiatives. These groups include Indigenous artists, groups, and organizations comprising First Nations, Inuit, or Métis peoples, culturally diverse artists, groups, and organizations, 
artists, groups, and organizations who identify as deaf and or having a disability, and artists, groups, and organizations who identify as official language minority communities. This includes Anglophones living in Quebec or Francophones living outside Quebec. In a little while, when we do an online demo, I'll show you um, where, if you belong to one of these four communities, where you would self-identify as such in order that you could benefit from the initiatives we have in place for that. Um, and we do engage individuals from these priority groups to serve on our peer assessment committees, what you might otherwise know as juries. We engage members from those communities as often as we can, both as a means of addressing these equity issues, but also to benefit from bringing diverse perspectives into our assessment process. Now, that's all I wanted to do to tell you about us. I'd rather spend uh, as much of my time talking about um, you and how you can access our sweet, sweet money. Um, so let's talk about your involvement with the Canada Council and the grant application process. Um, for any of you who have been applying for Canada Council longer than four years ago, you likely have noticed that we've gone through a very, very significant change in the way that we interface with artists. For any of you who are new um, or who have only been with council or applying for less than four years, none of this is new. But about four years ago, the Canada Council for the Arts, we moved our entire grant application process online. Um, the online platform that you'll be engaging with is called The Portal. In a little while, we're gonna take a little bit of a, a, a look at where and how you access the portal from our website. And the first thing that you do when you get onto the portal, um, when you begin the process of trying to access funding is you set up what we call your account and your artist profile. So let's take a look at that. Your account, the first thing you set up, your account is very basic. It's just your name, username, password, and some personal information like your address. Your artist profile is a bit more detailed. Your artist profile is your entry point into the Canada Council's grant application process because you can't apply for a grant until you get your artist profile. You can have as many different artist profiles as you qualify for. And what these profiles do is they determine which grants you are allowed to apply for. Each artist profile is determined by a very specific set of eligibility criteria. We're gonna take a look more closely at what that means shortly when we do an online demo. But first, I wanted to let you know about what are the three basic rules for eligibility to apply at Canada Council. In a moment, I'm gonna to talk to you about the difference between applying to the council as an individual or as a group or as an organization and what all that means. But since all of you listening today are individuals, I'll let you know what I mean by the three primary eligibility criteria for applying as an individual. In order to apply, you must be a Canadian citizen or permanent resident of Canada. You must be 18 years or over, and you must be either a professional artist or another category that we call new early career artists. Now those first two criteria, being a Canadian citizen or permanent resident and being 18 years uh, or older, that's easy enough to understand. So let's take a look at what I mean by professional artist or new early career artist. In order to be recognized by the Canada Council as a professional artist, you would need to meet the following criteria. At the Canada Council, a professional artist is someone who has specialized training in their artistic field, this doesn't necessarily mean in an academic institution. Someone who is recognized as a professional artist by their peers, in other words, other artists in your community who work in your field of practice would say, if I were to call them up, oh yes, so-and-so is totally a professional artist, you should give them all the money. 
Um, you would also be someone who is committed to devoting time to artistic activity. For example, if I looked at your resume and I saw that over the past 15 years, you've only really done one thing, it might feel like you're more like a hobby artist as opposed to a professional artist. And then the last item, uh, a professional artist is someone who has a demonstrated history of work in their artistic practice for which they were paid as a professional. And it's often that last criteria, the history of professional practice for which you were paid as a professional, that's often the sticking point for many that determines whether you meet our category called professional artist or whether you meet the category that I'll show you in a second. Um, and we always do take into account that for different artists, either working in different mediums or in different parts of the country, the access to getting paid work according to industry standards isn't always the same. So we always do try to be generous when awarding professional artist categories, um, but that's a conversation we can have individually later on. So like I said, we have the professional artist category, or if you felt you didn't meet that, we have what we call the new early career artist profile. So we launched this profile a few years ago. Um, it was a two year pilot program, but it is continuing on at least for now. And we launched this new profile as a way of opening the door as wide as we could for funding opportunities to a much wider a range of artists. Now, this profile here, it usually applies to artists who perhaps are just finishing their training or who are otherwise brand new to their artistic career. For example, you may have been a teacher for 40 years and now you're, you're fed up teaching and you wanna write a book about all of the horrible kids and what they did to you, well, now you're a writer. So you could be a new early career that artist that way, or this might apply to newly arrived Canadians who have experience back um, in the country of their birth, but that experience doesn't necessarily translate um, into Canadian practice. So perhaps that might be their route in. Now, um, just a minute ago, I showed you the criteria for being a professional artist. Let's look at the criteria for getting a profile as a new early career artist. And I think you'll see it's, the, it's a little easier. Um, you still must be at least 18 years old. You still must be either a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident. You must not already have an approved artist profile with the Canada Council. So frequently, let's say somebody has a professional artist profile in music, but they wanna start um, being a writer. And so they say, oh, I'll try to get a new early career artist in, uh, in literature. You can't have both. You either are a professional artist or you're a new early career artist. So if you already have a profile uh, in the professional category, there's no, don't waste your time trying to get a profile in this category. The next criteria, you cannot have previously received a grant from the Canada Council. And then the, more, the most important one here, all you really require is you must have some training experience or accomplishment in your chosen field of practice. That's not a hard bar to reach. It doesn't say how much, you just must have some training. However, if you are still, the last one there, you must be committed to the ongoing development of your skills and practice. We still do want to see evidence that this is for artists who are there um, and hoping to make a career out of their art. But if you are currently enrolled in artistic studies or training, you must demonstrate that you have previous artistic experience and are engaged in an independent artistic practice the Canada Council does not fund activities that are carried out to satisfy course requirements. What this means, um, if you are currently getting a bachelor's in visual arts, and I look at your resume and I can see that you have done some work outside of your training, 
you will qualify. If you have completed your training, you will qualify. But if your Bachelor of Arts training that you are still in the middle of pursuing is the first and only thing you've done in visual arts, you won't yet qualify. Um, and then on that last item, the Canada Council does not fund activities that are carried out to satisfy your course requirements. So you can't get a grant to pay for your training or to pay for projects that you do that are part of your training. I see that David has a hand up. He either wants to give me a high five or he has a question. A little of both, I think. Um, so in relation to uh, to the, these profiles, I have a question. Um, can you be a returning artist? I was a professional performer for a decade, turning to teaching for 20 years and want to return to a professional performing career. Uh, they've never yep. applied for grants before through uh, Canada Council, although they have worked professionally in Canada and in the US and in Asia. Um, I my experience my experience with this was when I created my uh, artist profile with Canada Council. Even though I was new to Canada, my resume uh, read as a professional artist. So actually, I applied as a new early career, and the in review they said, actually, no, you're a you're a professional artist. Yeah, we get that frequently. So first of all, what I can tell you, two things that I can tell you is that the, the decision, the, the validation on whether or not somebody gets a profile is made by an individual officer. It's like, we don't gather as a team and figure this out. Um, it's individual officers who make that determination. Different officers will review a resume differently and will interpret our criteria differently. What I can tell you is that should you ever be, and we're gonna talk about this later, should your profile ever be declined, it is definitely not the end of the road because it might be declined and we are purely looking for clarification um, or it might be declined and it might be come back to us in six months. Um, in your case, this frequently does happen where people submit a new early career artist profile and we reject it because you have to go for the professional level one. Um, and so if to answer, I, and I think this is pertaining to your question, if you were a professional artist 20 years ago, and then you stopped for X number of years to raise a family or whatever, and now you are back in the game, um, as long as it appears clear that the experience you had prior clearly was of a professional caliber, I don't think the 20 year gap is an impediment. Um, I, I've never made that an impediment. If you want to get back in the game, um, that's fine. You don't have to climb back up the ladder as far as profiles are, are concerned. Does that answer your question, David? I think that answers the question. Yes, right. it does. They said thank um, you. Um, all right, I'm going to keep on going. Um, so, now that I've told you a little bit about the basic rules for eligibility, I want to get back to explaining to you uh, the process of setting up and submitting your artist profile. And we are going to spend some boring time on this because, like I said, until you get an artist profile, you can't ask for a grant. So I want to make sure that this is clear. The way that the artist profile process works is that basically you are going to make three selections to determine your artist profile. Um, and based on those three selections, that will determine what your profile is. The first selection that you're going to make is what we call your applicant type. As you can see on the screen here, there are four categories of applicant type. There, you can be an individual, a group, an organization, or a foreign arts organization. For today's presentation, we're going to focus mainly on the kinds of grants that are available to individuals and groups, but we'll also talk briefly about what I mean by organizations, but we're not going to be looking at foreign arts organizations today. Now, um, I don't need to explain to you what an individual is. I'm one, you are all one. Great, we figured that one out. Um, so we're going to talk, first of all, about groups what it means to be a group. At the Canada Council, the applicant type category of a group would mean two or more individuals. 
And this could be uh, an artist's collective with a long history of working together, or it could be two or more people who have purely got together in an ad hoc basis uh, for, the, for the sake of working on a specific project. A group cannot be incorporated and the majority of persons in a group must be Canadian citizens or permanent residents. So when I was saying earlier that if you're an individual who is not a Canadian citizen or a permanent resident, you can't get a profile and you can't apply for funding, but you could be a member of a group. Um, because when I validate profiles for a group, like it says, the majority of those in the group must be Canadian citizens or permanent residents. So if I get a profile for a group and there's five people in the group and four or three of them are Canadian citizens, permanent residents, and one or two of them are not, I might be quite fine validating that group. Um, a few other criteria for this. Also to be eligible as a group, you must have at least two professional artists as leaders of the group. So earlier, I hope you remember how we defined professional artists. So your group must have at least two professional artists as leaders of the group and the clear majority of the members of that group must meet our definition of professional. So why am I telling you this? Um, I just described before the difference between a professional artist and a new early career artist. We get lots of applications for groups consisting entirely of new early career artists. We can't do that. Each of those new early career artists can have their own individual profile. They just can't get a group profile. However, if I get a group profile and let's say there's seven people in that group and five of them easily meet our criteria of professional artist and two of them are brand spanking new out of school, I'm fine with that. I just want to see that the majority of members of that group are professional artists based on our definition of that. So that's groups. Now let's take a peek at organizations. Um, what we refer to as organizations, we also refer to as companies. Um, and for us, these are different than groups. To be eligible as an organization, you must be incorporated as a not-for-profit. You must have been in operation for at least two years. You must have a history of at least two public presentations or productions, and you must employ professional artists and pay professional artist fees. Um, and it's that last item, the, the requirement for paying professional fees that is often most challenging. Um, I get a lot of profiles from, let's say, community theater companies. That's, I'm in theater, so that's often an example. I'll get a profile from a community theater company. They are incorporated. They have been in operation for at least two years. They have a history of 22 public presentations, but nobody gets paid. There's no, the artists don't get paid. The artistic director might get paid, but they don't pay their, their, their artists. They will not get a profile as an organization. Um, we do recognize that sometimes there's a gray area. Um, in all instances, it never hurts to call an officer and ask questions, but we'll talk about that in a bit. I'm gonna keep on going through here. Um, organizations may apply for the same kinds of grants that individuals and groups may apply to, but there are certain kinds of grants that only organizations can apply to. Um, and we refer to those as core funding, what you may also have heard about as operating funding, but that's, a bridge far, far away. Um, so like I said earlier, when you are in the process of creating an artist profile, you have to make three selections. The first selection we just talked about is whether or not you're an individual, uh, a group or an organization. The second selection you'll be making is what we call field of practice or what's also known as artistic discipline. At the Canada Council for the Arts, we currently support 11 different and distinct fields of practice 
as well as an entire program dedicated to indigenous arts of all kinds from, as you see here, from visual arts to theater, from multidisciplinary arts to deaf and disability arts, Canada Council supports a wide range of artistic practices. Each field of practice has its own broad definition within the council and within each field of practice, there are several profiles. And now let's see if I can do my online demo. I see that there's a hand raised, I think from Kate. So maybe Kate can ask a question while I switch over to my online demo. If Kate would like to send me the question in the chat. Oh, I'll, of course, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. That's okay, I'll, uh, I'll pass that over. And while Kate's doing that, um, do you all now see uh, a website for Canada Council that says bringing the arts to life? Yes, we do. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now um, is I'm going to basically take you through a live demo of what that process was of creating and selecting your, your artist profile and your account. And I may get uh, brave volunteers from the audience at some point. So um, like I said, everything that you do uh, for the grant application process is launched from our website. So right now I am at and can you see my cursor moving around here? David, you see that? Great. So I am at canadacouncil.ca. You'll always know you're on our homepage because we have bringing the arts to life in the center. Over on the top right, you see this green box with an arrow called portal. So that's where we're gonna go. And that's pretty much where you always will go. So here we are, we are now inside the portal. Um, did the temperature get lower? No. So here we are, we're inside the portal. Like I said, the first thing that you have to do is create an account. So let's say you already have an account, you would log in over here, but for the sake of creating an account, I'll show you, you would just click on that arrow and down here where it says, so if you have an account, you would log in with your username and your password, but to create an account down here, it's really quite simple. Username, email address, password, confirm your password, click create your account. And I think that might be it. I'm not gonna go that far down the rabbit hole here, but it may take you to the place where you have to enter your address and so forth and so forth. Um, but it is quite easy um, if I can say that. So now I'm gonna talk to you about what I meant by those three choices you have to make. So let's say after all of the conversation we've just had, you wanna figure out what are you eligible for? So let's check what you're eligible for. So I'm gonna click in here. And this is also the process that you would do, not just to satisfy your curiosity, but to actually submit a profile. So like I said, the first selection you have to make is select your applicant type. So you would click this drop down menu and there you see all of those categories I described, individual, group, organization, and foreign arts. For right now, let's just take individual. When I mentioned earlier that there are four designated priority groups, indigenous, culturally diverse, official language minority, and deaf and disability arts, that first one, indigenous, you would identify here should you want to. Um, and if you were to click that you are, Indigenous um, First Nations Inuit or Métis, it would let you know that we have an entire funding program called Creating and Knowing and Sharing. Do you want the option of applying to this program? Well, yes, of course I do. And then you would go through this process here, but we're not gonna be focusing on Creating and Knowing and Sharing today. So I'm gonna back up, I think I can back up. Oh, but I do see a hand that just popped up. Is that a question? It's uh, yes. Yeah, it's mine again. Um, will today, will there be more information about the deaf and disability programs? And if not, uh, where should people be going to find that? Um, so tell you what, let me, can you hold on to that question until we get to a pause? Absolutely. I'll so I will, be, I, will be, um, I will be showing you where like right now in a minute, I'll show you where you can identify as deaf and disability arts. Um, but just to let you know briefly, 
So I'll let you know briefly. There is an entire field of practice called deaf and disability arts. So theater and music are fields of practice. Deaf and disability arts is a field of practice. Um, we can click, tell you what, let's do that. And we'll, we'll actually do that right now. So let's say you selected individual as your applicant type. And then down here, the next selection you had to make was select your field of practice. So under all of these options, as you can see, there are all the options. And right now I will pick deaf and disability arts. So for the person who asked that question, try to remember these steps. Um, you would, once you select a field of practice, it gives you a definition of what we mean by that practice. And so let's say I read that definition and I clicked okay. And then the third choice, oh, so like I say, you have to make three selections. One of them is what type are you? The second one, what field of practice are you in? And then you select your profile. So within deaf and disability arts, we have different categories of profile from within there. What you will see is no matter what field of practice you select, whether it's deaf and disability arts or whether it's theater. And again, once you pick a field of practice, a definition will come up telling you what that practice is. All the profiles sound very much the same. You will see the same items in each of them. For example, you might you will see new early career artist in each of them. You will see cultural connector in each of them. What I want to show you now is let's say we're going to stick with theater for a little bit. Let's say you are a playwright. So you would click playwright and then it would give you the very specific criteria for what you need to make that profile. And in this case, to be eligible as a playwright, you must be a professional artist based on the definitions I gave you earlier. You must have maintained a practice as a playwright for a minimum of two years. You must have written, created, or translated a minimum of one theatrical work that has either been produced, workshopped, or published professionally. So let's say you are a playwright, but you don't exactly meet these criteria. You're just out of school, you have written a play, it certainly hasn't been produced or workshopped or published professionally. So you would click, nope, I do not meet this criteria. You would go back here and you would then pick new early career artist because when you pick new early career artist, you would see that, oh yes, I definitely meet all of these criteria and you would add that to your profile. The one other thing I wanna mention here in just about every field of practice, whether it's theater or others, do you see this term down here, theater professional? You're gonna see that term professional in almost every field of practice. So under dance, you will see dance professional, under music, you will see music professional and so forth. What I want you to know, that category of artist, sorry, that category of profile is not for dancers who conduct themselves in a professional manner. When we say professional in this section here, we mean the people who are behind the scenes. We mean the administrators, we mean the general managers, the producers and so forth. So if you are a dance tour coordinator, you would select dance professional. If you are a stage manager for theater, you would pick theater professional. Like I said, you can submit. So let's say you are a dancer, you pick dance artist, you agree that you do meet these professional, these criteria. You've been dancing professionally for God knows how long. You would click the green button to add it to your profile. And then, like I said earlier, you can have as many profiles as you qualify for. So if you thought I'm a professional dancer, I'm also a professional theater artist, you would hit add more profiles and you would start this process again. The next step that I wanna to talk to you about, so let's say, I do theater and I do theater artist. I add that profile and then I say, I'm done. That's all the profiles I wanna submit. It then takes you to this section, which is where you would self-identify as belonging to our other priority groups. 
So earlier above, I mentioned where you would identify if you are indigenous, but here is where you would identify whether you are culturally diverse according to our definition, which you see here, whether or not you are deaf and or have a disability, and you see our definition here, or whether or not you belong to an official language minority community, and you see our definition there. So to reflect back to the individual who asked about deaf and disability arts, I assume you could self-identify by clicking here, but you can also apply to deaf and disability arts as a practice. Um, and then this is, that's basically all there is from this window here. So I'm gonna get out of my website and go back to my PowerPoint. And I think then I see a question, but let me see if I can figure out how to do this again. Do you all see the slide that says presenting your artist CV resume? Yes, we do. Fantastic. All right, um, I think there's a question there or two. Yep, I have a couple of questions to run through. Um, right. Just uh, so is there, the question is, what if you're a disabled artist who's not producing deaf and disability art? Great. So when you say you're a disabled artist who is producing art, but the art itself doesn't happen to focus on deaf and disability art as a whole. That's great. what I believe the question says. So. What you could then do is, well, can you ask that person if the art you're producing is not deaf and disability art, what is it? Just what, what, genre, what field of practice is it? Digital art. Digital art. Okay. We, so <laughs> I am the, I'm the worst person to ask about digital art because I, I barely understand it. However, we do have a field of practice called digital arts. So if you are a digital artist who just happens to be deaf and or just or from the deaf and or disability community, then the profile you would create is individual. And then under field of practice, you would pick disability arts. And then under the profile, here, let's see, can I go back there? One second. I'm reluctant to back up. No, so you would pick individual, you would pick disability arts, or sorry, sorry, you would pick individual, under field of practice, you would pick digital arts, under profile type, I think it's called digital artist, and then under the various priority groups, you would self-identify as deaf and or having a disability. And so if you qualified, if you met our criteria, you would end up with a digital artist profile, and you would be self-identified as deaf and or having a disability. And the grants that you would submit would be entered into digital arts competitions. Great, thank Alrighty. you so much. Uh, I have a question about uh, types of screening that the Canada Council has in place to pre prevent ethnic fraud in regards to uh, identifying as indigenous. The person is from Six Nations themselves and, and finds it disheartening the amount of, of this type of fraud that happens. So, oh, just an easy question like that, huh? Um, so I can tell you that when we get applications from, sorry, when we get a profile from an individual and the individual has self-identified as either culturally diverse or um, deaf and or disability or indigenous, our policy is that we kind of take them at their word for it. And they get granted that profile. And there have been many times where I've been looking at a resume from somebody who says that they're culturally diverse and I'm looking at the saying, Rrr. but our policy is we take them at their word for it. If the jury encounters this and is aware of issues of identity fraud, the jury is more than able to bring that up. I don't think we are allowed to police it. However, when we get I mean, that said, if I get a profile from an individual who has self-identified as indigenous and there just so happens to be clear, 
I don't want to say evidence. Um, to answer your question, I'm not supposed to police that. But if I get a profile from somebody and their name just so happens to be in the news um, on an issue of uh, fraudulent identity, and I'm looking at their profile and they have identified as what the world is saying is fraudulent, at the very least, I would take that to my manager and say, what do I do here? Um, but what I can tell you, when we get a profile from a group or an organization that has identified as one of our, one of our priority groups, for the group and organization, we have to get them to then um, go through an exercise whereby they provide more evidence of that. Um, the exercise has five different steps to it. Um, and that helps us to determine whether or not they truly, um, for lack of a better term, deserve that credit, that, uh, that designation. Um, but as much as possible, we try not to get into the area of, of investigative policing of these kinds of matters. Right. But I, but I completely appreciate the question. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, for group applications. Do the professional artists need to be professional in the same field? A dance group ah. applies for the dance professional and a literary professional. So um, if I get a profile for a dance group and inside that group, there are seven people of which only two of them are dancers, the other two are writers, the other two are media artists, then I might go back to that group and say, you need to submit this as a multidisciplinary group or as an inter-arts group um, because it doesn't seem like the majority of you are dancers. However, if I get a dance group profile and there's, let's say seven of them and five of them are dancers, and then they also have a musician and they also have a filmmaker. They quite likely, when you submit a group profile, you can kind of write a little description about your group and they quite likely would have written in that description why there's such an eclectic makeup to their group. And normally I wouldn't have a problem with that. My general rule is the majority of members have to be from that field of practice. The majority of members have to be professionals the majority of members have to be Canadian citizens or permanent residents. I'm very reluctant to put an absolute, like 100% of you have to be X, Y, and Z. Great, and I just have one more quick one for an organization uh, profile. You said they must hire professional artists. Uh, do the professional artists have to be known to the, to the Canada councils? So in order to, yeah, okay. No, I mean, I would like, let's say you're a, um, for the sake of an organization, if you're a theater organization, um, I would likely, if I have to, I would just try to find out what kind of contracts you put your artists on, but I don't need to know who are the actors you hired for this show. Right. No. Um, okay. Um, is that if questions? Can I go back to the thing? Uh, there are a few, but I will, I will track those and we can come back to them. All right. And I think we're going to have a, a, a spot for questions in a bit anyways. Um, okay. So um we've gone through the artist profile process so let's say you have made your selections you know which profile you're submitting you're ready to actually submit it um now is the time when you upload your resume and your resume or your cv that is pretty much the only document that you have in order to demonstrate how you meet our criteria and so it's very critical, it's if not essential, um, that your resume is presented in such a way that I, because it'll be an officer like me who's looking at this, can quickly and easily determine if you meet the criteria. And when I say quickly and easy, um, an officer like myself, we don't want to spend more than five minutes going through this. Um, this is meant to be an easy and simple process. So. Uh, how can you help me help you? Well, um, when you are preparing your resume, make sure that you fully understand what are the criteria for the profile you are applying for, and then take a look at your resume. Is that 
evidence there? And is it there in a way that is easy for me to see? Um, and the second item kind of ties into the first item. When I'm looking at your resume, the style and presentation of your resume matters nothing to me. It's just the content. And so um, I have no problem if when you submit your resume, you have a highlighter and you have highlighted, these are the credits that are professional. Or you just write down, I got paid $1,000 a week for this gig. I don't care. You will always have an opportunity to re-upload your resume in a nice fancy way when you apply for a grant. But for the sake of this process, I just want to see quickly what I need to see. And the things that I'm looking for that help me identify whether or not you meet our criteria are names, dates, and whether or how you were paid. So for example, if I'm looking at the resume of a playwright to see if they had a professional production, or if one of my colleagues is looking at the resume of a visual artist to see if they've had a professional exhibition, what I would be looking for with the playwright resume, I would be looking for the name of the theater company that produced the workshop of your play. So if you write in your resume, I have had a play professionally workshopped. That tells me nothing. But if you say, my play was workshopped at Theater Aquarius, then at least I know, okay, it was workshopped by a professional company. Um, in the same vein, when I'm looking to see that you have had two years of professional experience, it helps me if you tell me which year you graduated from school or it helps me if you put the years of your credits because I can then track, well, they've been doing this for more than two years. And let's say you're, um, I'll stick with theater, for example. Let's say um, you're a theater artist that has been, everybody is gonna know you're a professional. Then I'm not too worried about you putting too many details in your resume. If you're, let's say Rick Roberts, uh, who lives in Hamilton, I'm gonna know from looking at his resume that he's totally going to meet our criteria. But many artists on their resume, they have a few credits that are paid professional work. And then they have a lot of credits that might not be. I get tons of those resumes. I have no problem if you draw my attention to the most clearly designated professional credits. And I have no problem if you tell me, you know, for this exhibition, I was paid Carfac rates. For this dance show, I was paid on a CADA, is it called CADA? I was paid on a CADA contract. For this theater gig, I got an equity indie 2.0 contract, but the rest of this stuff is uh, amateur theater. Just make it easy for me to see. Now, like I said earlier, you can submit as many profiles as you think you are qualified for. However, you can only submit or upload one resume. So let's say you are a dancer and a theater artist and you wanna get profiles for each of those. When you upload your resume, please edit your resume so that you have combined your theater experience and your dance experience. Make it really easy by separating, like here's all my theater credits, here's my dance credits, um, and upload that as one. I think that's it for this slide. So. I have just a very quick question about that in terms, in terms of the, I guess the, the on the CV. For, uh, for visual artists, should our CV provide more details on collectors, even though they're currently looking, the artist is currently looking to focus on exhibitions, not private commissions as part of sort of professional payment? I don't understand that question at all. Can you say that again? For visual artists, should the CV provide more details on collectors? I'm assuming people that have bought their art. Um, so it, if, if the person, so I'm, I'm definitely not a visual artist. I never look at visual arts resumes. If, if, the, if what that means is, should I put, if the info that you're wondering, should I put this info in my resume? If that info would help my colleague over in visual arts get an easier understanding of your professional status, then yes, put it in. Um, 
Yeah. Like it's the equivalent of if a theater person said, should I put names of the, um, the theater companies I've worked for or the, well, that's not a good equivalent, but the answer is, I think, yes. If that info would help my visual arts colleague understand you better, by all means, go ahead. Is that cool? I think so. Yes, because the, the, the questions that are that are coming up around that as well from someone else. So visual artists, they say only make money selling their work. So how does that work? Then yes. And yes. So if if that means by putting info on collectors, if that means that these are the instances in which my work was paid for, i.e. this is my professional context. Yeah, go right ahead. Great. Great. Thank you. And, um, um, OK, so. Let's say uh, you have done that process. You have submitted your profile. What happens next? So your profile will be reviewed by a program officer in that field of practice. So I'm only going to be looking at theater profiles. It can take up to 15 days or longer to get your profile reviewed. And so if you, if you know that you want to submit a grant for an upcoming deadline, and you know that you need to have a profile to submit that grant, please submit the profile way before the grant. Um, if I get a profile request two days before a grant deadline, you might not get in, no matter how much I try, you might not get in in time. Um, if your profile is declined, you will get a brief explanation of why. Um, some officers might write in detail about why it was declined and what you need to do. Other officers might just tick off the reason why you didn't get it. Um, but like I said, if you are declined, oftentimes you have an opportunity to reapply. You might even have the name of the officer who declined your profile. And so maybe you can email them for follow-up. It is by no means the end of the road. Um, and I think, yeah, so here was where I was going to pause for questions. So, David, if you have questions that are related to what we've just talked about, go right ahead. Okay, so uh, in with a group, um, this person is disabled, but the other two people are not. They're creating a musical with a main character who is disabled, um, and setting is the setting for the performance is going to be in a place that deals with a lot of folks who are disabled. Yeah. So I'm assuming it's about uh, uh, the group and the majorities. Question. Yeah, so I would say that would be a borderline one because from what I've heard you say, the it sounds like the purpose of the group is to focus on disability arts. Right. The content of what the group is doing is disability focused, but not all of the members of the group are from the disability community. So I would say you can definitely try um, you can definitely try to either self-identify as uh, disabled and or having a disability or submit to a deaf and disability arts competition, but it sounds like it's a gray area and it would be up to somebody other than me to follow up with you. Right. Um, for the uh, CV in the big three, I'm an emerging writer and have only been paid occasionally. I didn't include that in my CV, sadly. Is that a problem? Um, so you're using past tense. So I'm guess this means that you've already submitted a profile recently. Um, did you submit a profile as a literary writer recently? Is that why you're asking? Let's see if they reply to that question. Um, so uh, what I can say is, um, it sounds like you recently submitted a profile. Um, it sounds like you have some paid experience, but you didn't indicate that in your resume. Um, it's going to be up to the officer who sees it. They might decline it and they might say something like the resume doesn't show enough evidence of professional experience, in which case you could either reapply with a resume that you have put more detail in, or you could reapply for a new early career artist profile. But if you feel that you do meet the professional level criteria of literary writer, as opposed to new early career artists in literature, then I would recommend resubmitting a profile with a better explained resume 
Um, I would always try to get the professional level profile if you think you can get it before going for the new early career artist profile. Um, excellent, thank you. What would, uh, so for an organization, what would an organization provide instead of an individual artist CV? Is it combined CVs based on the field of practice? So a group, thank you for the question, a group would have to provide the resumes of all of the members of the group. What an organization has to pro, uh, provide an organization has to provide um, evidence that it is incorporated. So this is often letters of incorporation or articles of incorporation. Um, we might need um, uh, a document from the governing body, let's say the province of Ontario, confirming that you are a nonprofit in good standing. Um, but what an organization also has to provide is there's a section where you write down your mandate, your mission, your history, your history of public presentations, and you basically are writing out all of the stuff that helps us to identify that you meet those criteria. There's no resumes, there's no resumes involved, but when you are writing out your history, you will likely be referencing who the artistic directors are, who the founder of the company is, how long have you been in operation? Um, do you have paid staff? You'll likely be writing all that stuff down. Great. I just have two more questions. Uh, the first one is, if there are only two people in a group, a fine artist and an engineer, can they qualify? I would assume that that's you write a, 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 an application and then you have a partnership identified yeah. in that application. So a group. So based on the question, a group that only consisted of one artist and one non artist, i.e. the engineer, that would not get qualified for a group profile. However, that visual artist can definitely get a profile as an individual, and that visual artist can submit a grant where they want to work in partnership with an engineer. Perfectly fine. Um, there's a question on eligibility. We are a not-for-profit theater company, but we are not yet incorporated. Uh, we are part of the uh, Kawatha Works Community Cooperative, which is an incorporated not-for-profit. Could we apply as part of the KWCC to fit this eligibility point? Also, also, we only have one year of programming. Could we apply since we do not have two years of programming complete? So I would encourage you to, um, at the end of this presentation, you're going to, especially since you're a theater company, um, that's a very, very detailed question. Um, I don't, so you're gonna see my email address at the end of this. I would just say email me because um, my answer to that question is not likely gonna serve anyone but you. So email me. Um, but if you, you just said you're not for profit, but you're not incorporated. I, I don't see how the two of those uh, work together. So I think your situation is complex. So email me later and we'll talk about it next week. Right. Um, if there's no other questions, I'm gonna keep on going. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's keep going. I'll, I'll track. Uh, all right. There's a couple coming in, but we'll, I'll track. Okay. Um, so um, what I'd like to do now is move on to the segment where we can talk about the various funding programs we have and the kinds of grants that you can apply for. Um, presently at the Canada Council, we have six different funding programs. And within each program, there are different grant components. Um, the programs and components are not based on individual fields of practice. For example, we don't have a theater department or a dance department. We have programs and each program is based on the kind of activity that it is meant to support. And let me show you what I'm talking about. So, we have six programs. Within each program are components. The first program, this is the program that I work for, Explore and Create. And within it are four, pro, four components. We're going to be talking about the first three today. Explore and Create is the program that most of you will be applying to. This is the program where usually um, you submit grants to create work, to produce work, or to become a better artist. Um, if you are an organization that is seeking multi-year operating funding, your program would be called Engage and Sustain. But 
in order to get in here, you have to already have a pretty successful history of project funding. So you would know if you belong in here. Um, this is the program Creating, Knowing and Sharing the Arts and Cultures of First Nations, Inuit and Métis Peoples. Um, only applicants that identify as First Nations, Inuit and Métis may apply to this program. Um, but artists that do identify as First Nations, Inuit and Métis may apply to this program and any other program. But this one here is specifically for First Nations, Inuit and Métis artists. The next program, Supporting Artistic Practice, this program and the components within it are not so much for artists creating projects. These grants are more about the kinds of um, funding that can support the arts milieu. So for example, the Hamilton Arts Council likely has a uh, profile as a support organization and because of the kind of work that Hamilton Arts Council does, which is to support the arts sector in Hamilton, most of its grants would be in here. And then we have two programs, which are basically about moving art and artists either across Canada or across the world. So if you are looking to tour your works, or if you are looking to travel as an artist, or a few other things in here, these are the programs you would go to. What we're gonna focus on today is my program, Explore and Create, because this is where the bulk of most of your grants would be going to. So what is Explore and Create? This program supports individual artists, groups and organizations who wish to research, create, develop and present new artistic work, who wish to participate in artistic residencies or who wish to develop their professional artistic practice. There are four different components within Explore and Create. Today, we're gonna to look at the three components that are most useful for you. The first one being professional development for artists. So this component supports the career growth of Canadian artists, groups, so artists and groups, by encouraging participation in a wide range of development opportunities, grants fund activities that contribute to the professional advancement of Canadian artists. These activities may include, but are not limited to, mentorships, internships, apprenticeships, specialized training, workshops. Please note, this component does not fund your long-term training at an accredited institution. In other words, you can't use this grant to pay for school. The maximum grant allowable in professional development for artists is $10,000. You can submit one professional development artist grant per year. And soon you're gonna see what I mean by per year. And you can only submit that one grant if you are within your annual application limits, which I will explain shortly. The next component, research and creation. The research and so just back here, just to summarize, if what you want to do, if you're an actor and you want to take a puppeteering class, or if you're a dancer and you say, you know what, I'll be a much better dancer if I need to take a tap dancing workshop. These are the kinds of things here. Or if you want to mentor under an artistic director so that you can learn what it's like to be an artistic director, or if you want to travel to California to take this very specialized workshop in puppet making. These are these kinds of grants. The next one, research and creation. The research and creation component supports the initial stages of the creative process. Canadian artists, groups, and organizations can apply to develop and make creative works. These grants provide support for creative research, creation, and project development. These grants may also be used for artistic residencies. On the subject of artistic residencies, let's say you are a dance artist and you want to be the dance artist in residence at the Hamilton Library. This could be a grant for you because the focus of that project is not necessarily on the creation of work, but of being a resident artist. Great, submit the grant here. However, 
if you want to be the dance resident artist in Austria, then you would be submitting a grant to Arts Abroad Residencies. Any artist residency that is outside of Canada would be within Arts Abroad. Any grant for a residency within Canada would be research and creation in Explore and Create. So basically, research and creation is for creation of a work, the research and or creation and or development. If you are producing your play or your dance piece, this is not the grant for you yet. We'll talk about that in a second. This is for everything prior to production. These grants here, the maximum you can get is 25,000 for a project lasting up to one year. You may submit two research and creation grants per year, provided you are within annual application limits, which I'll talk about in a sec. And then we have concept to realization. The concept to realization component supports the full creative cycle from the initial idea through to presentation at any stage of the creative continuum. Note, concept to realization grants may include creation development activity, but they must include the fully realized production and or presentation of the work. Most of these grants do not exceed $60,000. They can, in exceptional circumstances, go up to $100,000. You can only submit two concept realization grants per year, provided within our limits, blah, 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 blah. So what are the differences between research and creation and concept realization? So let's say you're a theater artist. You want to write and workshop a play. It's a research and creation grant. You want to produce that play. It's a concept realization grant. If you're a filmmaker, you want to write the screenplay for the movie that you're eventually going to create. That's a research and creation grant. You want to produce that movie. It's a concept realization grant and so forth and so forth. If you're a writer, you want to write the next great novel. It's a research and creation grant. But you, as a writer, want to self-publish that novel? Sorry, you can't do this. We do not allow literary writers to self-publish. A writer can definitely get money to write the book, but the writer cannot self-publish. Now, in this one here, where it says concept realization can support the full creative cycle. Technically, I'm going to use theater as an example. Let's say you are a theater maker and you want to write a play and produce it. Technically, you can submit a grant to concept realization to cover everything. I want to research the play for six months, then write it for six months, then develop it for six months, and then produce it at the end of that 18 month cycle. Technically, you can submit this grant here. It might not stand a very good chance because without the jury knowing what the play is yet, it's gonna be hard for the jury to give have faith in giving you money to produce it. And so even though you're allowed to do it, I would always talk to an officer first to come up with an effective strategy. So those are the main grants. Are there any questions about that? Uh... So there's a question about uh, creating performance work that's being performed in both Canada and abroad. Yeah. Um, so when you say that it's being performed both in Canada and abroad, I suppose the question depends on how much time there is between the Canada and abroad. So for example, if um, let's say you're creating a dance piece and that dance piece is going to have a premiere. Oh, there's the dog. Fuck. Um, let's say the show is going to premiere in half. Come on a sec. Get treats for the dog. Mercy, come here. Get, get, get. So let's say your um, your dance work is going to premiere in Hamilton in fall 2022, and then it's going to tour to uh, Mexico 
in spring of 2023, then the fall 2022 premiere could be the subject of a concept to realization grant. And the tour to Mexico could be um, a circulation and touring grant in arts abroad. What I always recommend is whether you are looking for a strategy of how to manage your domestic slash international project, or whether you are trying to figure out whether your grant falls into a research and creation component or a concept realization component, you will do all of us a favor by contacting a program officer well in advance of the deadline. Um, I cannot stress that enough. Um, other questions? Uh, what is the difference between a research grant and a professional development grant, specifically for an emerging visual artist in the explore and create category? What okay. creative what creative research would be considered professional development? Or would creative research be considered professional development? Um, without knowing more, when we talk about when we talk about research based grants, that fall within the research and creation component. If the research you are doing is research about a particular subject that you will then create. So let's say you want to paint, um, you want to paint butterflies. And before you paint the butterflies, you need to research butterflies. That would be a research and creation grant. If your research is research purely for the sake of research, you want to research butterflies without even knowing if you eventually want to paint butterflies. If the research is compelling in an artistic way, and if that research might have an impact on your practice or your field as a whole, that could still qualify for a research and creation grant. However, professional development grants are more about skill development. So I would not normally see research as skill development. If, so again, I would contact an officer first. Like if you're a visual artist and you are researching why this paintbrush is best for creating this kind of work, are you doing that for an artistic inquisition or are you doing that to figure out how to be a better painter? If the answer is more towards skill development, it's likely a professional development for artists grant. If the answer is because you're on an artistic uh, quest, it could be a research and creation grant. For something as specific as that, I would definitely reach out to an officer. And with, with professional development, so skills development, if the workshops or classes that they want to uh, um, learn from are come from multiple sources is that acceptable so you would be looking to develop your skills but i'm looking to to attend several yeah. different sessions yeah so let's say um let's say you're a dancer and you have been out of school for five years but now you feel that you want to dramatically broaden your horizon and so over the course of a year you want to take a workshop in flamenco dancing at this institution, and then you want to take a workshop in contemporary dance from an entirely different source, and then you want to um, spend a week apprenticing under a ballet teacher from an entirely different source, that all could be one professional development project. And ideally, you would wrap that all up in a cohesive fashion, where the overall purpose of that project is to be a better, more global dancer by the by doing the following three things. But yes, that could definitely be a professional development for artist grant. And in today's uh, climate, is there anything that goes against that professional development happening online? Obviously, there's a lot of things that you can attend online for you. No, okay. Um, no, um, you can definitely do that. Dan asks, would a music album project be allowed to release independently under the concept of realization grant category? Would it be able to release independently? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so concept to realization grants are meant for projects that are presented to the public. So in a theater case, it's the production of a show, hopefully in a live audience. In music, 
the production of that work, the work that you recorded in a studio, let's say, um, oh, sorry, in a music scenario, the research and creation grant would frequently be money to support the writing of the songs. And in music, a concept to realization grant could be taking the band on tour and presenting your new album on tour, or a concept realization grant could be going into a studio and recording that album that you then release independently. Um, whether it comes to you independently releasing the album or a label releasing the album, that I would forward that question to a music officer. Um, and at the end of this seminar, you're going to see an email address for me, but you're also going to see an email address for my program. Um, and you could basically just, dear Explore and Create, here's a question for a music officer, and that'll get forwarded to a music person. So I'll, I'll explain that when we get to that slide. Other questions or? Um, I think, uh, I think I've, I'll some of these for later. That's all right. Oh, oh those are just, just sorry, just the clarification that, um, sorry, professional development workshops taking place in another country. Would that be arts abroad or professional development? Um, if it's a professional development workshop and not a residency, it definitely could be professional development for artists grant. And for any work taking place abroad um, that involves travel, it is now incumbent on the applicant to make sure that the travel that they want to do is safe in terms of COVID. And if you get the grant, you may be awarded the grant conditionally, i.e. we may see congratulations on your grant to travel to Portugal. We will give you the grant when it's safe to travel to Portugal. So there may be conditions imposed. All right, I'm gonna keep on going because we only Please. have 40 minutes left and I've got way more to do, uh, lots more to share. So um, we're gonna talk briefly about the application process and forgive me, but I'm gonna speed through this a bit now. The process is quite simple, I suppose. Um, the granting process involves, first you create your account and you get your profile validated. Then you have studied what the various programs are and you apply for your grant. The grant then gets assessed. Um, it gets assessed by a jury of your peers. Eventually, you will get results. It will normally take about four months between you applying for the grant and you getting the results. Depending on the time of year and whether or not Christmas is going to interrupt our cycle, it normally takes about four months. You will get one of three results. You will either get a grant that says, you are successful, here's the money. You will get a letter that says, we regret to inform you that your grant was not successful and you're not getting the money. Or you may get a letter that says, although the jury saw merit in your application and recommended it for funding, due to limited budget, blah, blah, blah. If ever you get a letter from us that has the word recommended in it, please know this means that you did a good job and you wrote a good grant, just everybody, a, a, a bunch of grants were a little bit better than yours. Recommended means the jury wanted to give you the money. We just didn't have enough money to give out all the grants. So don't ever let a recommended letter make you think that your grant was not good. And if it's, doesn't mean that your unsuccessful grant is not good, but recommended is pretty good. Um, and then once you get the grant and you do the project, you have to submit a final report in which you basically tell us what you did or what you didn't do, and you tell us how the money was spent. The step that isn't formally on our process, but I want you all to observe, is the step in between um, you getting approval to apply for a grant and you applying. Please reach out to us before... if. If you're an expert grant writer and you've been into our system for a long time and you know where X goes and where Y goes, you're probably fine. But if, if you have uncertainties about what kind of component to write or when should I submit my grant for this project, like I said, you will do us both a favor by reaching out to an officer beforehand, ideally well ahead of your deadline. 
Very quickly, what's involved in a grant application? Information about you, your group, your organization. That might be your mandate. It might be your history, resumes, and so forth. Then obviously, info about your project, where you tell us all about your project. You tell us who is involved, what's the timeline, and so forth. Your grant will include a budget in which you tell us all of your expenses and all of your projected revenues. Your grant will include support material, which we're going to take a peek at in a second. And then your grant may include other documentation, letters of agreement, and so forth. Um, every grant will require different amounts of information. This will all be laid out in our guidelines. So if you are new to this, please read the guidelines first. I can't tell you how many people that I know are new to grant writing, and it's clear they have not read the guidelines. And the guidelines are readily available to you. So support material, for those of you who are new to this. In my estimation, support material is the additional information and documentation that you include in a grant that can accomplish one or both of the following. Support material can give the jury a better sense of the experience and ability of the artists involved. For example, resumes, samples of your past work, letters of support from really cool artists who are known, who tell me that you are a really cool artist. Those pieces of support material give the jury confidence in your ability. The other thing that support material can do is it gives the jury a greater understanding of the project that you are seeking funding for. Don't forget that as you try to describe this great project, you're doing it in written form. You're answering a question, but that answer might not be enough to really give the jury a sense of what it is you wanna do. And so support material can help fill in the blanks um, that your written description can't. For example, if you are writing a play, you might have a work in progress, a couple samples from that work in progress. If you are um, doing new paintings, you might have sketches of what the work might be. You might have videos of your work in process or songs of your music in process. So that is another thing that support material can do. It's important to know that the jury will spend probably not much more than 10 minutes reviewing your support material. So please choose your material wisely. Some tips about that. Choose quality over quantity. Show me your best work, not all of your work. Um, upload the materials in the order you want them seen. Knowing that the jury might only spend 10 minutes, then try to imagine which is the most effective and important piece of support material and upload that first. Don't tease me by saying, oh, just wait till you get to item number eight. No, put that item first because the jury might not get to it otherwise. Submit material that does have a clear relationship to your current grant application. For example, if you are writing a play and it is in a certain style of writing, it might help if the previous sample of work is somehow related to that style of writing and not something completely different because that might not help the jury understand. If you are submitting video, Choose material that shows your work from an artistic perspective and not a promotional video. Um, what I mean by that is if I'm looking at the trailer for a new movie and that trailer is like in a land before time and there's gonna be like all kinds of crazy jumpy edits and people screaming and cars exploding, that's gonna not really impress a jury because they're not gonna be able to have a sense of what's really going on here. Um, and then obviously, Present your material in a way that shows it off in the best possible light. Here's an example of that. Um, these are the two same pieces of visual art. The one on the left is much easier for the jury to get a sense of how good this is or not than the one on the right. So when you're looking at your material, whether this translates into a sound file that does or does not have distortion or a script sample where the font is so small that it's impossible to read, or a video file that you want me to look at the segment that begins on 
minute nine, but you didn't tell me to start at minute nine. Present your material in a way that shows it off in the best way possible. Um, okay, I'm off support material. Now, you heard me say earlier, provided you can submit two research and creation grants provided you're within the annual application limits. So let's talk about that. You can submit three project grants per year. And when I say per year, I mean between March 1st and February 28th. So we are now nine months into that year. And so technically you can still submit three grants between now and February 28th, if you haven't already. And I say three project grants. Some of our grants are project grants. Some of our grants are not. All of the grants that we talked about in detail today are project grants. So for example, you can submit two concept realization grants plus one research and creation grant, or you could submit one concept realization grant, one research and creation grant, and one professional development for artist grant. Here's an example of a bad thing happening. Like I said, you can submit three project grants. Today, I was looking at the eligibility. I was doing something we call an eligibility checklist for a concept to realization grant. Sabrina, do you remember how many concept to realization grants are you allowed to submit per year? Hold up your fingers. No, two. There you go. Sabrina remembers. So you're allowed to submit three grants, but only two of them can be concept realization. So I got a grant today from somebody. It was their third grant of the year. It was their third concept realization grant of the year. So I had to kill it because it's not even allowed to be there. And when we say the number of grants per year, we don't mean the number of grants you receive. We mean the number of grants you submit. In addition to your three project grants, you may submit additional opportunity-based grants. So let's say um, you are a fabulously talented, fabulously talented dance artist. You have submitted three grants already, but you get a call from that company in Kelowna, BC. They want you to take your show and they're saying, can you please be here next year? Uh, you can submit a circulation and touring grant because that is an opportunity-based grant. All of this info is on our website. So on our website, you're gonna see something called um, frequently asked questions. And in there, there is a question, how many grants can I apply for per year? And there is a very detailed PDF that explains to you what you can and cannot do. Next slide here. Um, let's talk about what I mean by the difference between cutoff dates and deadlines. Um, we don't really have deadlines anymore for many of the programs. We have what we call cutoff dates. And if you take a photo of that link there, um, it's pretty important that you check in on that once in a while because our cutoff dates, they kind of change from year to year. Um, and so you can miss the boat if you're not paying attention to where the boat is going and when it's leaving port. Um, but for example, our research and creation and our concept realization components have two competitions per year. We just had one that closed in October. Our next one is in April. I'll tell you about that in a second. Our professional development for artists component has four competitions per year. And like I said, these competitions don't have deadlines. They have cutoff dates. Each cutoff date is connected to a specific competition and each competition will have its own specific date for when you will get uh, results. So if anybody goes to that link, it will be much clearer for you to understand than me telling you about it, but I will do my best right now. So. Our next cutoff date for either research and creation or concept realization is April the 8th, 2022. So if you don't yet have a profile, you've got plenty of time to get that profile. But what we mean by that cutoff date, any grant submitted between now and April the 8th will be entered into a competition that closes on April the 8th, 2022. 
results from that competition will come in August 2022. Before I explain what that means, for professional development for artists, our next cutoff is February 2nd, 2022. Results from that competition will come in May 2022. Some of the rules of how this works. You're allowed to submit any of these grants anytime you want, but depending on when you submit it, it gets entered into that competition. So let's say Sabrina wants to submit a research and creation grant. You can submit it today. It will automatically go into the competition that closes April the 8th, 2022. The activity that you want funded must begin after you submit the grant. So Sabrina, I'm just gonna keep on using you because you're on my screen here. Let's say hypothetically, Sabrina, you want to do a research and creation grant and to do that, you need to go to Cincinnati, Ohio to interview somebody who is gonna die on January the 2nd. And so you have to start your project on January the 1st because your interview subject is gonna die and you have no choice. So you have to submit your grant before your project begins. So if you get on a plane January 1st and you wanna get paid for that flight, your grant has to be submitted before then. However, that grant, because you submitted it January 1st, it'll be entered into the competition that closes April 8th. You're not gonna get results until August. The jury doesn't really care if your project has begun or not. The jury doesn't really care if they are deciding whether or not you get funds for money that you probably have already spent and you're hoping to get reimbursed for. They're not supposed to care about that. And so you are allowed to submit a grant for which you have already paid money knowing that you may not get the results for a while. You may not even get the money. You're allowed to do that. I always tell people, if you don't wanna take financial risk, then start your project at a date, which is after the results come. So for example, if you submit a grant today, you're not gonna get results until August, sorry, if you submit a research and creation grant today, you're not gonna get results until August, 2022. So if you wanna be perfectly safe, make your project start September 1st, 2022, so that you know that you're not gonna to have to use your credit card to pay for a flight that you won't get reimbursed for, for example. But if your project must begin sooner than when you get the results, go ahead, you're allowed to do it. Um, like I say, always talk to an officer to help figure this out. I kind of see myself as not your financial advisor, but your grant advisor. And what I wanna do is not only help you achieve your artistic objectives, but I want you to fully understand the process so that you don't basically screw yourself out of an opportunity um, like that. All right, um, I have another time for questions. I still have one segment of the presentation, which is on tips for applying for grants, but I'm sure there might be questions at this point. Yeah, I think, and I think I just want to clarify that the, I think the information that you're going through is really rich. And if people do have very specific questions that they, they should direct those either to you or to explore and create or an appropriate officer um, following this session. I did want to ask, uh, a, or a clarification that then um, in terms of the timelines of sub submitting grants, that doesn't come into the, the competitiveness. A grant that comes in way before a cutoff date is not more likely to be funded than a grant that comes in the day before. No, but what I can't, so for example, um, so we just had, um, I am now reading grants from the competition that closed October the 6th. The competition before that closed, I think it was April the 8th of 2021. And so if somebody submitted a grant April 9th, 2021, it automatically got entered into the competition that closed October 6th. When I read the grants or when the jury reads the grants, it's based on which grant entered the competition first. And so if you do submit your grant well in advance of the deadline, chances are the jury is gonna read that grant sooner because 90% of the grants are submitted on deadline day, on cutoff day. There's no real tactical advantage 
to whether or not your grant is submitted well in advance or not. And I always tell people, um, if unless you have an absolute need to submit your grant well in advance of the cutoff date, please take the time you require to assemble and write the best grant you can. Um, otherwise, trying to determine if it's good, if your grant is read early by the jury or late, nobody really knows. If they had a bad day and they're reading your grant, that might be the factor. Great. Uh, Sabrina asks, do you have any recommendations for alternate funding sources to augment projects? Uh, and are artists required to report to Canada Council if they are funded from other sources? Um, do I have recommendations for other sources? Um, I mean, yes, other funding bodies. So um, whether you apply to us along with a provincial funder like the Ontario Arts Council and a municipal funder like Hamilton Arts Council or Toronto Arts Council, it's, I think it's always good to have other sources of funding. Some grant components almost require that you have other sources of funding. And if your grant, if your project is too heavily reliant on ours, it might not look very good. Um, other sources of funding other than granting bodies could be private sector fundraising that you do on your own, earned revenues from selling your project or selling tickets to your project. Um, another source of funding is something called in-kind revenue, which is where an organization or a partner donates something for free. Let's say, for example, they let you use their studio for free. That is seen as an in-kind revenue, which has value to it. Um, as to should you report that? So I think, yes. Um, let's say hypothetically, you have a project that costs $50,000 and you apply to me for $50,000 and you get it. And I am giving you that grant because the jury is giving you that grant because the jury says, you know what? The project is so good. She deserves to get it, even if our grant is the only revenue in the project. And later on, when you submit your final report, you report back that you spent our 50,000, but that you also got $25,000 from the Hamilton Arts Council. And so you actually, your project became a $75,000 project. And I write back and say, well, why didn't you, did you know about that Hamilton Arts Council grant application when you asked for ours? And you say, yeah, but I wasn't sure whether to report it. We do want transparency. Um, there will be cases if we feel like somebody was intentionally not telling us about another revenue source, we might just say, great, please give us back the money. And you might say, well, the money's spent. And we might say, great, well, we're just going to put a big flag on your file. So on your name. So we love to have transparency whenever possible. Um, these are public funds. Um, and I know that I'm pretty strict on this, that these public funds need to be uh, treated quite um, respectfully from both sides of the equation. Great. Again, this is always a question that you can talk to an officer about in advance. Thank you very much. And actually, this is one of uh, my questions, was also sort of my experience in terms of the, uh, the support material. Um, we tend to have to use uh, set up a, a Vimeo account or I'm not sure and do they take YouTube videos as well so instead of uploading a video directly we're actually supplying um, links Link. and they have they have to be very they have to be very specifically to something like Vimeo so I do recommend yeah. if you don't have a Vim, Vimeo account um, set yourself one up yeah uh, but can I actually I just want to go back to the thing about reporting other revenues yes so please because um, here's another, so the me you just heard before was the hard ass. Now I'm gonna give you like the, 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 the me that offers clever tricks. Um, and it's not, easy, it's not even really a clever trick. It's actually quite realistic. Um, most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, when you ask a funding body for money, you don't often get all of the money you ask for. So let's say you ask Toronto Arts Council for 10,000, you might get 7,500, let's say. At Canada Council, we have recently begun a policy of awarding you 100% of what you ask for. That's pretty new. 
But typically, you could expect to get around 80% of what you ask for. And I think that's almost true across the board. So here's why I'm telling you this. Let's say you are submitting a grant that has a budget that has, so let's say you're submitting a grant to me, but you're also submitting a grant to the Ontario Arts Council. You need $50,000. Let's say you're asking each of us for $25,000. When you submit the grant to me, I don't mind if you submit a grant to me that has a projected revenue from us of 30,000 and a projected revenue from OAC of 20,000. Alternately, I don't mind if you submit a grant to OAC that has a projected revenue of 20, 30,000 and a projected Canada Council revenue of 20,000 because you are being realistic. If you get both grants at 100% of what you asked for, and you have 10,000 more than what you needed, then give us each back 5,000. Um, but what I don't want you to do is put yourself in a situation where you're going to lose. So if you need 25,000 from each of us, and you need that money, and you tell each of us in the budget that you're looking for 25,000, but we each only give you 20, then you're out 10,000. So I would rather you lie a little bit and then report back that you have more money than you needed and, and return it. All right, Sabrina's like, what did he just talk about? All right, let's keep on going. Um, no more questions. I'm gonna go on to tips for grant writing. All right, so um, with the time I have left, I'm gonna try to um, share some bits of advice on grant writing. Um, I've got 10 little tips here. Um, for me, um, this is always the tip I start off with, um, because I think one of the best pieces of advice that I can give is to remind you that pretty much every single grant application you will ever write is really a process of answering the same five questions. And those five questions are, what do you want to do? Why do you need to do it? How are you going to get it done? How much will it cost? And what will change as a result? If you've written as many grants as I have, you will see that all of the various questions usually lead to these questions. And so you should be able to know the answers to these. What are you doing? Why are you doing it? How are you going to do it? How much will it cost? And what will change from having done it? Because if you can answer these questions to yourself, you will then be able to put this extremely vital information into the questions as they are posed by each specific granting body. So this tip certainly would apply to Canada Council grants. It will probably apply to a private sector foundation, as it will apply to the Toronto Arts Council, as it will apply to asking the rich person who lives down the street for money. Like, this is always going to be the same kind of thing. Um, but of those questions, I do think that one question is particularly important. And for me, that question is why? Um, because when it comes to assessing your project, I hear from juries, when I listen to juries talk about an application, I hear them focusing on things that for me pertain far more to the why of what you're doing. Um, juries get, I think, more excited by having a sense of what your rationale for your project is, why you want to do it. So what this basically means is when you are explaining the why of your project, you might want to consider things like, why is this subject matter important to you? Um, why are you doing it now? Why are you the person to do it? Why is this format the best way to do it? Why are these collaborators the best ones to work with? All of those why questions, because to a certain extent, if you yourself can't explain the why about your project, um, the assessment committee will likely wonder why they should fund it. So I think knowing that all important rationale is key. The third tip I want to give you is to keep the assessment criteria in mind. So basically what the assessment criteria are are the things by which a jury will assess and measure your grant 
And as they read your grant, the jury is going to be scoring your grant based on assessment criteria. So it's very important that you know the assessment criteria and that you know and understand which of the grant's questions are tied to which criteria. Because once you understand the criteria and once you understand how each question is tied to a criteria, you will frame your answers in a way to reflect that. So if you're not sure what I mean by assessment criteria, I'll show you. These are the assessment criteria for a research and creation grant. Your research and creation, and just so you know, all of these criteria, no matter what Canada Council grant, are right there in the guidelines. You can go look at them all today. They are readily available. Um, the jury will know them intimately, so you should know them intimately. But for example, in an artistic merit grant, sorry, in a research and creation grant, your criteria are the project's artistic merit, and then it explains what we mean by that, the project's impact, and then we explain what we mean by that, and then the project's feasibility and what we mean by that. What you see there with the 50%, 30%, and 20%, every grant at Canada Council is scored, and we use a score based on 100. And so your artistic merit is going to be worth 50 points of those 100. Your impact will be worth 30 points. Your feasibility will be worth 20 points. Um, that's important for you to know to a certain extent because you might want to make sure that you really communicate the artistic merit. But what I can tell you is that literally the difference between getting a grant and not getting a grant is quite often less than one full percentage point. Um, when I said earlier, if you get a grant that says recommended, that'll mean the jury wanted to give you money, but I ran out of money at a certain point. I will often run out of money. Let's say your grant gets a score of 82.7. You might get a grant, but if you got 82.6, you might not get a grant. I say that to tell you to please fight for each of those points, even feasibility. Um, every point there is literally the difference between you getting a grant or not getting a grant. Um, the next tip, start as early as possible. Um, if in doubt about what kind of project, uh, what kind of component your project is best suited for, uh, or any kind of question, please contact a program officer sooner than later. I will be very happy if next week I see a bunch of emails from people um, from the lovely city of Hamilton. Um, next thing, get all of your, your lovely ducks in a row. Um, your grant is going to require a lot of documentation, a lot of confirmations. Start getting that stuff sooner than later. Start working on your budget sooner than later, because for many people, that's the hard part to figure out. Um, like I said, read those guidelines, know what your assessment criteria are. And for those of you who have multiple projects on the go um, and who want to lay out a funding strategy to cover all of your work over several years, put all of your deadlines in a grant calendar. Um, I have a massive spreadsheet of grant deadlines and so forth that goes back like 15 years. Um, if you have a lot of projects on the go, especially if you're a theater person, reach out to me and I will help you lay out a grant writing strategy that will keep you very, very busy. Um, next tip, write like yourself. When a jury is reading grants and they are literally reading 125 to 150 grants, which is an exhausting process, um, what they truly are looking to do when they read your grant even if they don't know it, they are trying to get to know who you are. They are trying to get to know the artist who wrote the grant. And so it really helps if you write the grant in your own voice. Um, the jury wants to know who you are and what matters to you, because I'm telling you at the end of the day, it's not just your project that they are funding, it's you. The jury might not think that directly, but it's true. They are funding you, and so it helps that you communicate who you are. So please write your grant in first person. I don't want to read, you know, they are an artist. No, it's all I. Um, don't be afraid to write your grant in a style that truly sounds like 
you are having a conversation across a table. Some people have a knack for writing a grant in a way that just feels like it's an off the cuff conversation that is honestly a fine style to write in. You don't wanna be flippant, you don't wanna be super cute, but really you, you do wanna write in a way that makes it easy for the reader to connect with you. Um, your own specific context can be quite important, um, especially if your unique context is relevant to the project, it doesn't hurt to let the jury know about you. So that might be your social or political or cultural background. It might be the unique circumstances of where you live or what you're coming from. Relaying that context can be quite important. Um, as to the style of writing, um, your grant is not an academic paper. So please do not write it as, it, as if it were. I get a lot of grants from people who just completed their PhD and their grant sounds like they just created their PhD and it bores the pants off of a jury. So please don't present your grant like an academic paper. And in the same vein, you don't need to try to impress a jury with your art speak um, by, by letting your grant communicate just how hip and cool you are. Really the jury just wants to um, get to know about you and your project. That is certainly the case in theater. In other fields, it might be different. Um, next tip, know who your grant's audience is. The people reading your grant are artists. They are your peers. This means that they know how your art gets made, which means that they can recognize what will work and what will work and they can recognize a reasonable budget from an over the top budget. In other words, you cannot bullshit this jury through this process. Damn it, you're recording this session and I just swore. Um, you cannot pull the wool over an eyes. If you say, you know, uh, this project is gonna take four months of travel in, in Tahiti to figure out how to do this. The jury's gonna say, no, 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 it's not. You are talking to experts who have done what you wanna do before. Um, so know that you are talking to those experts. In the same vein, um, depending on where you live, especially if you live in a major city, which is where we usually pull our juries from, um, these jurors might know you. They might know your work. They might very well know the community in which you live. And so you wanna be honest about yourself and your work and your community. But on the flip side, chances are, the jury doesn't know you. Um, in this room here of 180 people, most of you are gonna be emerging artists, which means that in my jury of four people, maybe one of them has heard of you. Maybe one of them knows your work. So you definitely want to make sure that you are presenting yourself in a way to help the jury get to know who you are. And, oh yeah, that was it for that slide. The next tip, Please avoid the following in your grant writing. Don't exaggerate. Um, beware of any sentence that you write that begins with, I am the only artist in my community who blah, 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 because chances are you're wrong. Um, don't make things up because the jury will sniff through it and they will not like that. Um, don't say that you are working with so-and-so unless you know that you are working with so-and-so because so-and-so might be on the jury and might say, oh, I'm not working with them at all. Um, if the so-and-so that you are working with is a really big deal, it might help to get a letter from so-and-so. Um, and please do not criticize others in your grant writing. It does happen once in a while where I'll get a grant, let's say we are the only theater community in Hamilton that is doing quality work because the rest of the community has been stagnant for the past 10 years. Ugh. That's gonna piss somebody off on that jury. So be careful about criticizing others. Um, tip number eight, please remember that this is a competition. And so I need you to compete and treat it like a competition. Um, when I said earlier, the difference between getting a grant or not getting a grant can be less of a decimal point, literally, the person who got 82.3 will get the grant. The person who got 82.2 will not. 
what is that point one? Where that point one per, uh, difference come from? Maybe because the budget didn't have enough budget notes, or maybe because the one answer to the question just felt sloppy. Um, so treat this as if you're going to the grant writing Olympics. And if you take it that seriously, your grant will come out better. Sloppy effort will equal sloppy results. Um, yes, please do take the process as seriously as you take your practice. And this is the hardest tip that I give because I know that most of the time, uh, especially if you're new, most of the time, you're not going to get the grant when you first try. So if at first you don't succeed, please try again. Um, this is a quote uh, from, uh, I think it's from Wayne Gretzky's father, but literally you will miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Um, you can't get a grant from us unless you ask for a grant from us, unless you apply for it. And I know, um, perhaps not as much as, as I used to, but I know that it definitely sucks when you get the letter that says you did not get the grant. But please, when you get that letter, try your best to get some kind of understanding of why you didn't get the grant. Unfortunately, we're not in a position to give you feedback anymore, but you might be able to figure out through some other means of why the grant wasn't successful. Oftentimes, the grant wasn't successful, not because it was bad, but because one person just scored this much ahead of you. So please try again. Um, I have seen people submit one grant, not get it, and then tell me, that's it. They're done with this process. They're frustrated. I'm like, dude, like one grant. So please try again. I can't guarantee that you'll get it, but you won't get it if you don't try. Um, there are many officers that will bend over backwards to spend as much time with you as they can to help you present your grant application in the best way. So do reach out to them when you can. Um, feel free to take a shot of this screen. So like I was saying, if you, if you are a theater person, you're gonna see my email in a second. <clears throat> Otherwise, depending on the kind of program you want to apply for, like if you send an email to explore and create at canadacouncil.ca, it will get forwarded to a program officer based in your practice. So if you do send that generic email, it helps to say, hi, I am a visual artist. I would like to know about this. Um, if you start talking about blah, 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 without clarifying which field of practice, it might take longer. So help us help you um, by clarifying who you need to talk to. And um, there's my contact info, should you want to send an email to me. Um, if you don't hear from me soon, we have periods of the year where we are ridiculously busy, and then we have periods of the year where we're quiet. This is a bit of a ridiculously busy, um, so it might take a while to hear from me, um, um, but I'll do my best. Um, and like I said, uh, you can help me help you by being really succinct and clear about who you are, what you're doing, and what info you want. Um, that's it there. I think we're pretty much almost, we're over time. I'm sorry. That's um, okay. I can, def I can definitely take uh, a few questions if you have some. Well, I was going to say, could you just, uh, for the questions that have come up that relate specifically to profile ed eligibility organizations and groups, where should those emails most directly go? Um, I would say, if the profile question, if you're pretty confident that the profile question would fall within Explore and Create, I think you can send it to Explore and Create at CanadaCouncil.ca. Otherwise, I would send it to info at CanadaCouncil.ca, um, or you can try me, and if I can answer it, I will. Otherwise, I might have to forward it to a colleague. Thank you very much. Um, and so there are there are questions that have come up that we haven't gotten to today. I do implore you to send those uh, to any of the the information that's been made available. Uh, one of the the most uh, important pieces I took away from a couple of years ago when we did this, Sean, was that the the Canada Council want to fund programs. They want lots of applications, and so the process is there, and the offices are there to to really help you. To, to move forward in this process. So take that overwhelmed, intimidated uh, feeling sometimes that we get towards writing applications and, and use the tools that are available. Um, 
Yeah, so I would like to to thank you, Sean, so much for your time. I know that I have uh, I've made a situation where you've had to take two days of information and condense it into uh, into a two hour session. Um, and I hope that there will be more opportunities for for people to to learn through series like this in the uh, in 2022. Um, is there anything in departing that you would like to sort of share with the people that are here? Um, just to leave it on the parting words, um, not only do we want applications, um, we truly, truly do want uh, artists to understand our process, and we really do want you to succeed. I mean, we many of us are artists, um, but when I say that we want you to understand our process, um, we know that our process is mystifying, and we know that it's sometimes because we've made things confusing. Um, the easier it is for you to understand, the easier it is for us to do our jobs too. So I really do mean it. We say, when we say we encourage you to reach out to us, we, we, we absolutely mean it. It makes everything easier for everyone. So please don't be shy in reaching out to an officer. Um, and if ever you do reach out to an officer and you're not having any luck getting a hold of them, send me an email and I'll go, I'll go virtually tap on their window. And if there's uh, and anything with that as well, if there's any questions that you have that you're maybe not sure whether it's uh, something directly for Canada Council, I do encourage you as well to email me, uh, David, uh, you can get me at community at hamiltonartscouncil.ca. Sean, thank you so much for your time again. I'm going to uh, end the recording there.